Well, hello everyone. My name is Wilhelmina Siroka. I am the education specialist here at New Hampshire Audubon. And I'm thrilled that you could jo join us for tonight's pollinator series as we discuss, well, as Nick discusses, the secret life of wild bees. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this presentation is streaming from our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is located within the site of the ancient village of Penacook in Endakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki people past and present. I would like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the al Nambak, who have stewarded Endakina throughout the generations for thousands of years. New Hampshire Audubon is honored to continue the stewardship of these lands, providing opportunities for all people to form connections to the natural world through our programs and wildlife sanctuaries located across the state. I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here you can explore and click on territories of indigenous people and get connected to resources to learn more. For a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, please check out all the educational resources at indigenousnh.com. Some Zoom information before we dive in. dive in. Tonight, we have approximately 65 or so people that are Zooming in this evening. And so you will see that we are in full webinar mode, which means that your mics have been turned off, your cameras are equally off, we cannot see you or hear you. But that does not mean we do not want your participation. We have the Q&A button down below, which we encourage you to use specifically for questions. And we also have that chat button, which I've already gotten you guys acclimated to. So feel free to put in any reflections or comments within there, but do reserve the Q&A for questions. Many thanks go out to the Benjamin and Gertrude Couch Foundation for their generous grant, which enables us to bring these amazing speakers to our webinars where we can share in their enthusiasm and learn from their experience without having to leave the comfort of our homes. Before we jump into tonight's presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. For those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that is completely independent from national Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic pillars. Conserving around 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for both habitat as well as recreation, researching trends and discovering solutions for species in peril, connecting people to nature through environmental education via school programs and field trips, summer camps, and webinars like these, and advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature to protect the natural environment for wildlife and for people. If anyone in attendance tonight is a volunteer, a member, or a supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. We simply couldn't achieve our charitable mission without you. And if you'd like to become a part of our conservation family today, please check out our website for ways to get involved. I'd like to pass the mic now to our senior biologist, Diane DeLuca, who has been an integral part in the development of not only this pollinator series, but in the incredible pollinator demonstration garden located at our headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire. If you haven't yet checked it out, I highly encourage you to take a trip. Diane, whenever you're ready, we'll introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks, Willa. I'd just like to give a shout out to Willa for being the co-host of our pollinator series this spring. It's been really wonderful to work with her. Um, and we have one more, but it's not until the fall. So we're wrapping up with Nick during pollinator week. Um, so Nick Dorian is an ecologist, an educator, and a naturalist. He's a PhD student at Tufts University where he studies the population ecology of cellophane bees. Nick's graduate study dives deeper into the lives of bees when they are not foraging on fly flowers, um, which I'm really fascinated to hear more about. And Nick received a, a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Environmental Studies from Tufts. 
And as an undergraduate, he studied bumblebee ecology and served as president of the university's student garden. These activities fostered a deep interest in plants and pollinators that spurred his PhD work. During that time, he also committed to science communication, delivering workshops about pollinators to local gardening groups, beekeeping clubs, and school students. He's a founding member of the Tufts Pollinator Initiative, which is an ecological and educational effort to conserve and raise awareness about urban pollinators. The group plants gardens, teaches classes to undergraduates about pollinators, and holds regular events that are open to the entire Tufts community. He's also co-president of the Tufts Biology Union of Graduate Students and captain of the biology department's summer softball team. When not doing schoolwork, Nick enjoys exploring wild places, going for long runs, tending his gardens, and experimenting to create the perfect tortilla. And Nick, we're so excited to have you tonight. Thank you so much for sharing your important work on native bees with us and for being a champion for pollinators. So we have much appreciation for what you're gonna share with us tonight. Oh my goodness, Diane, that was a really wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Um, you even slipped that thing about the tortilla in there. Um, I've been told that my connection is a little bad tonight. So I'm gonna say hi and I'm gonna turn off my video, um, uh, but I'm still here. Um, please ask questions, be curious, um, and we'll answer all of the questions in a healthy Q&A at the end. Um, but I am going to uh, get started. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about secret lives of wild bees. And uh, before I get started, Diane did allude to the fact that I run the Tufts Pollinator Initiative. Um, although we're focused on urban pollinators, our website and our social media has a wealth of online resources, much of which complements uh, the information I'll be presenting tonight. If you come to pollinators from the gardening perspective, you can find lists of plants herbaceous plants, trees, shrubs that we recommend. If you come at this as an entomologist and you want to learn more about bees, we have identification guides. Um, and if you uh, don't fit into any of those categories, I promise there's something on there for you as well. Um, so I want to start by talking about what we're not going to talk about tonight. And that's actually uh, these guys, the, the European honeybees. Uh, Apis mellifera, which is the bees that everyone thinks of when I say, oh, I'm a bee scientist. Um, we're not going to be talking about bees that make honey or bees that live in big colonies that survive the winter that, or bees that have a penchant for hexagons. That's these guys. Um, and the European honeybees are, are not native to North America. They were actually brought over in the 1600s from Europe. Um, and by and large, they are, are managed um, by beekeepers. You have big boxes of, of hives and uh, they are brought to farms for pollination and they make honey. And honeybees are great, um, but you may have heard sort of concerns in the media about honeybee decline. Save the bees, um, colony collapse disorder, and it's even inspired artists to create an uh, example of graffiti like this. There's only one problem in that the honeybees, the bees that everyone's concerned about, the ones that Greenpeace is concerned about and Cheerios is concerned about and even Angelina Jolie is concerned about. They are the ones that don't need saving. Honeybees are actually just fine. There's more than 2.8 million hives in the US, each with 30 to 50,000 bees per hive. And I think there's a really neat analogy to be, to be made here, which is that honeybees are uh, an agricultural commodity. In order to get crops, we bring honeybees to farms. And you can think of conserving honeybees to save wild bees about as backwards as conserving chickens to save wild birds. Now, raising backyard chickens is not a conservation strategy to save wild songbirds. And just like raising backyard honeybees is not a solution to save our wild bees. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, not the one species of honeybee, but the 4,000 other species of wild bees that live in the United States, 400 plus of which live in New England. These bees come in every size, shape, and color you can imagine. They are red, they are blue, they are green. Some are bigger than rigatoni, others are smaller than orzo. Some have a penchant for sunflowers, others only visit ironweed, and still some don't ever leave the dunes of the beach. 
Now, uh, although there's lots of concerns about honeybee declines, those concerns extend also to these wild pollinators. Um, for example, the rusty patched bumblebee, one of the most abundant cranberry and blueberry pollinators in Eastern North America, has now retracted its range 90% over the last 25 years, can no longer be found in New England and is only found on, in, in the Midwest, in the Twin Cities, um, as well as a sort of odd mountain range in West Virginia. But this is alarming because in my lifetime, this bee went from being abundant in the region, and perhaps I even spotted one as a kid on clover, to I now have to travel over 1,500 miles to see one, and I've never seen one. And um, the rusty patch bumblebee is one of those species that I think serves as a bellwether of what's to come. There's, we have data on the rusty patch bumblebee extending back decades. Other bees, we don't have those sorts of data. Um, and if we look at the data we do have for bumblebees, um, we see that many species are in decline. So what I have on the x-axis here is uh, a measure of relative abundance. And on the y-axis, we have all the different bumblebee species found in Vermont, and many of these extend also into New Hampshire. And I want you to point out, I want you to look at the, the red dots. The red dots mean that this species has significantly declined uh, over the last 100 years. But notice that for every red dot, there's also blue dots meaning there are species that are increasing over that same time period. So bees are responding to the way we're changing the environment. And I don't want this talk to be all doom and gloom, that bees are disappearing and there's nothing to be done about it, and that in our lifetime, there will be no bees left. That is not the case. What I do want to talk about is the nuance, that the way we're changing the landscape favors some species and doesn't favor other species. Um, and the ways we can change the, or make the, how we can change the landscape uh, to make those declining species happier um, has a lot to do with bee biology. And so we're going to talk all about bee ecology and bee biology to give you the knowledge you need to uh, make informed decisions as a gardener or make decisions to support conservation groups um, or at least just appreciate bees a little bit more um, in your everyday life. I do want to say that the, the threats that are facing these wild bumblebees, like Plotus aphanus, are manifold. We have pollution, climate change, agriculture, lawns, one of the biggest irrigated crops and monocultures in the United States, pesticide use like neonicotinoids, habitat loss, and exotic species. And importantly, each of these threats doesn't act alone, they act in synergy. It's a, a poisoned cocktail for these bees. And uh, the synergy between each of these threats, among others, is what undermines our native bee populations. Now, you know, given good efforts to, to address these declines, we've been hampered somewhat because I think one of the biggest threats to our success is their big secret because there's a lot that we don't know about our native bees that are critical to conserving them. So although there are things that we know like pesticides are bad, there's big gaps in our knowledge. Um, and as a scientist, I uh, spend a lot of my time trying to fill some of those knowledge gaps by following bees throughout their life cycles. So in order to save the native bees, we need to know the native bees. Um, and so I'm going to back up just so we're all on the same page of what is a bee? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about and come up with a, a definition. Perhaps when you think of bees, you think of an insect that's sort of orange and black and visits flowers. But this is not a bee. This is a drone fly. It has big bulbous eyes, stubby antennae, and just two wings instead of four. Perhaps when you think of bees, you think of um, pesky insects that visit your summer picnic. But these aren't bees either. These are yellow jacket wasps, the carnivorous insects that visit our meals, whereas bees are vegans, vegetarians, and they would only visit flowers. In fact, that is one of the main characteristics of bees is that they are vegetarians. This is a bee, it's on a sunflower. She's a longhorn bee and she is packed with pollen. She has a dusting of pollen on her thorax, on her face in between those blue eyes, but she also has loads of pollen on her legs. These hind legs are stuffed with pollen that she's bringing back to her nest. And that's in fact my definition of a bee, a vegetarian wasp. 
And to understand why this is my definition, we need to go back in time a little bit more. In fact, we need to go back 130 million years. That's before flowering plants were a thing. And before flowering plants were a thing, there didn't need to, bees weren't a thing because bees visit flowers. And in this sort of very uh, ancient um, time period, the, there were primitive flowers like magnolias and water lilies that were just starting to emerge on the scene. Now, the timeline we're here talking emerging is like over millions of years here. Um, and the insects that are visiting these primitive flowers are, um, some of them are known as thrips. Thrips are flower feeding insects and they, they sort of chew on flower petals and flower parts. And there are wasps, which are carnivorous, which hunt these thrips. So there are thrip hunting wasps, they specialize on thrips. Now, as these primitive flowers began to produce pollen, some of these thrips also became dusted in pollen. Now, the convenient thing about pollen over an insect like a thrip is pollen doesn't move. And so it became quite advantageous to specialize on protein-rich pollen as a pair compared to just specializing on thrips. And so from this group of 20 species of thrip hunting wasps radiated out over the next 130 million years, over 20,000 species of bees found on every continent except Antarctica around the world. Bees are highly diverse as I pointed out earlier. And intriguingly, some of the most biodiverse places of bees around the world are not the wet tropics like it is for birds, but in fact, the deserts, Arizona, Chile, South Africa, the Mediterranean. In Arizona alone, there have been found more than a thousand species of bees. That's more than all of Eastern North America, east of the, the Mississippi combined. Um, if you're curious why, we can certainly talk about that at the Q&A. Um, so bees are vegetarian wasps. Um, and as a result, they have all sorts of adaptations. Wasps are sleek because they need to hunt and maneuver through the air quickly to catch prey. Bees have adaptations to collect their prey, which is pollen. Their hairs are branched. In fact, this is a, a trait unique to all bees. Somewhere on every bee's body exists a hair that is branched, meaning there's a single, a single hair and then branches coming off of that. And this effectively increases the surface area of their body. And so they're able to carry more pollen per trip and raise more offspring as a result. And so this, that longhorn bee I showed earlier was just totally covered in these tiny grains of pollen. And that pollen actually sticks to her hairs like a balloon sticks to your hair with static electricity. So as a bee visits pollen, a flower, not only are they actively collecting pollen, but the pollen literally magnetizes to the bee's body and draws the pollen um, uh, away from the anthers so that it can be more effectively transported. So in order to save our bees, right, we, we have a definition now, a bee is a vegetarian wasp, all bees need pollen and nectar to reproduce. But what else do our bees do? Not only do they visit flowers, but they build nests, locations where they're going to bring that pollen and nectar back and locations where they're going to give that food to their next generation. And in addition to building nests and visiting flowers, bees also have a very often extended period of time when they're hibernating in the nest out of sight. Um, and so we're gonna go through each of these, um, these traits today. Perhaps the best known native bee and the one that you probably all know are bumblebees. They are big, fuzzy, charismatic. They appear in Shakespeare and they've captured our imaginations as the, you know, the, the, the humble, as they used to be called humble bees, the, the humble bumbling bees of the insect world. Now, bumblebees like honeybees are social in the sense that they have colonies headed by a queen. In early spring, the queens emerge from hibernation and this is the only bumblebee present at the time. She zigzags low along the ground, looking for a suitable cavity to build her nest underneath a, a, ro a rock or beneath a shed or in a rotting log or an old rodent's burrow. She collects pollen and nectar to, to, to provision her first cohort of eggs. Then her workers emerge, and these are all females, and they are tasked with collecting pollen and nectar to grow the next generation, their sisters. Over the summer, right now, Workers can be found on flowers and they're busy collecting pollen. You might hear them buzzing on the rose flowers in your garden um, or by the beach. Late fall, when the colony is big enough, they switch from producing workers, which don't reproduce, to producing new reproductives, queens 
which will continue the generation, and males for those queens to mate with. The males, like in all bees, sort of serve one purpose, which is to mate. And the queens and the males mate, the, queen, the, the males die, the old colony dies, all the old workers and the old queen dies, and this new mated queen finds a nice cozy spot under some leaf litter to spend the winter and then emerge next spring. In summer, these bumblebees do an amazing thing, which you can observe in your garden. They do a thing called buzz pollination, where they grip the flowers and they vibrate their flight muscles incredibly fast. This effectively releases pollen from the flower. You can hear them buzzing on roses. You can hear them buzzing on tomatoes, on chilies, on eggplants, on blueberry flowers. Almost 50% of our native bees are capable of buzzing like this, but honeybees cannot. And so buzz pollination is a trait that makes our native bees particularly effective pollinators of our native plants. So what do bumblebees need? In order to get bumblebees in your garden next year, this generation of bumblebees needs a safe spot to nest. They need flowers every month of the year. The queen needs flowers in spring, the workers need flowers now, and the new queens need flowers like goldenrods and asters in the fall to fuel up before winter. And then they need a safe spot to spend that winter. They need undisturbed leaves in your garden um, or in the forest. Now, although our bumblebees are social, this is actually far from how most of our native bees live. There are highly social honeybees, which represent less than 1% of the bees in uh, Eastern North America. Uh, in fact, the most of the bees are solitary, meaning they live in, uh, in nests without a queen. They don't make honey. They don't live in a hive. Every queen is responsible for, uh, every female is responsible for all the tasks in the nest. And as a result, these solitary bees, which make up the majority of our native bee diversity, are incredibly gentle because there's no colony or society to defend. One of my favorite solitary bees and the species that I study for my graduate work, in fact, I study in Concord, New Hampshire, are cellophane bees, the genus Calides. Now, like bumblebees, cellophane bees have one generation per year, but the flight period is very short. So in spring, males and females emerge. Over the summer, they develop in the nest, underground. In the fall, they pupate into adults. And then over the winter, they hibernate. So in early March, this is usually when I'm getting ready for my field research, Spring seems so far away. There's no leaves on the trees. This is from a local park uh, in, in Medford in Massachusetts. And it's just bare sand at this picnic area. This was taken one day before the cellophane bee emergence this year. The following day I returned because it was 55 and sunny. And I found males, these adorable little bees, zooming low along the ground, warmed by the sun's rays and looking for females to mate with. I hope you can see this video that I'm gonna play. Are you able to see the bees zooming around the ground? I'm looking, I'm not sure if I'm seeing them, but I've got crappy eyes. <laughs> so I'm, is the video not playing? Oh wait, I, no, the video's playing. Yeah, I can see them. I really yeah. do have see them, Diane. Diane, you got it? Yep, I'm, I can I'm see gonna, them. I'm going to play it again just to give you guys a, a sense of this. So this was taken on March 20th this year. Um, and this is at a local park. It's on a south facing slope, so it gets a lot of sun. And these are males zooming around the ground looking for females. When they find a female, the males sort of pounce on her mm -hmm. and they tumble across the ground in these wild, lust fueled mating balls. Females mate just uh, let's see. Um, females mate just once, so she finds a suitable mate, um, and she mates just once, and she carries all that sperm uh, for the rest of her life. Um, after mating, the males get out of the picture, and she can actually continue with the hard work um, on her own, not distracted. The females build, they guard, and they provision their own nests. And what I mean by this is she digs a hole underground. Um, she piles the excavated sand in a, what looks like an ant hill at the surface, except it's a bit, the entrance is a bit wider, about the width of a pencil. And she builds this nest in the company of other bees. 
So if you can see here, there's pale sand mounds um, all uh, across the ground. And each of these mounds is a single nest owned by a single female. And although they're solitary bees, I consider them social butterflies. They really like their neighbors. But to, how do you remember which mound of sand is yours? Well, females have this remarkable uh, memory. So she'll remember where in the picnic area her nest is. And then in order to, to locate her nest at a more finer scale, she actually marks the nest entrance with chemical pheromones that are unique to her. So she remembers her nest by smelling her nest. And this is one thing that I think makes bees a bit harder to relate with, relate to, in that bees see the world very differently than we see the world. You know, it's, e it's easy relatively to go bird watching. They sing at a frequency we can hear. They, are, they see in the same color spectrum, for the most part, that we can see. But bees see the world through um, their, their, their smell. They use their antennae to sense flowers, volatiles, and fragrances that we can't detect from miles away. Um, and so relating to a bee and being empathetic with a bee is definitely takes a bit more patience and um, observation, something that I've learned over the last uh, uh, years in my, my graduate work. OK, so these females build this nest, and she has to now lay eggs. So underground, um, she's laying eggs, and she collects pollen and nectar to provision these, these eggs. Remember, bees are vegetarians, so they're getting all of their protein from pollen and all of their sugars, their carbohydrates, from nectar. And it turns out this cellophane bee's favorite flowers are red maples. So the red maples are one of the earliest spring blooming trees. Now you might not think of a tree as having lots of flowers, but you know by the end of March in um, New Hampshire, maple trees are blooming and the cellophane bees are, are up there in the canopy. She'll collect all of this pollen and nectar to bring it back to the nest. And she'll unload her groceries in a little um, chamber that she's created the night before. It's called a brood cell, and it effectively is a mini jelly bean uh, that's underground. So this brood cell she creates with her saliva. She paints her saliva along the uh, inside of the nest, and this actually solidifies into a waterproof lining akin to cellophane, which is where they get their names. So she has this baggie, this jelly bean baggie underground. She deposits pollen and nectar in sort of a liquid soup then she hangs an egg from the ceiling and she seals it off. And inside this nest, over the summer, out of sight, the egg hatches into a larva. It munches on its lunch underground all throughout the summer until winter when it hibernates as an adult and emerges one year later. So their season is really only about four or five weeks. And for the, the remaining 11 months of the year, they're underground. Now, this is what I'll say that um, I know that fermented foods and mead and beer is like a, a big thing right now, but these bees have been doing it for tens of thousands of years. In fact, the food that they're eating, this pollen and nectar, also contains ample uh, microbes, yeasts and bacteria that naturally occur in flowers. And if you look at the provisions, they actually look bubbly. There's active fermentation happening in there. Uh, not in this image, but if you look at it outside. So there's active fermentation happening in the, the brood cell, and this is thought to increase the nutrition of the food. So bees are not working in isolation or only working with plants. There's a whole host of partners, often invisible, that are playing a role in keeping our bee populations healthy. Something to consider when fungicides are applied. Yeasts are fungi. So if you apply fungus, even if the trees are still there and the pollen is still there, those important microbe partners for bees may not be. Now, this nest, which I excavated, um, uh, and you can see the, uh, the sort of the lining that I've painted with chalk, it extends about 12 inches down. And inside this nest is these, these brood cells. Uh, it's rich with pollen and nectar, and it takes a female many trips to make this, to, to provision this nest. And during those trips, she encounters flowers and potentially other males that attempt to mate with her. And in, that, in all of that work, she oftentimes um, receives unwanted visitors on her back, hitchhikers. Some of these hitchhikers belong to a beetle. They are the larvae of this beetle, Trichrania. And this beetle has a remarkable life cycle. So this beetle emerges in spring, lays eggs in the sand, 
And those eggs hatch into larvae, which clamor onto the males of this bee. Upon mating with a female, uh, the male incidentally transfers some of those larvae onto the female's back. The female carries those larvae down into the nest. The beetle larvae hop off, kill the egg, kill each other, and a single beetle emerges a victorious, eats all of the pollen, and develops on the pollen and nectar to emerge next year. Talk about a game of chance, right? This female beetle has just laid eggs randomly in the sand, and somehow the beetle larvae make their way down into the nest on the back of a female, and unknowingly that female dooms her own nest. And how common is this? Well, I've excavated many cellophane bees in my life, um, and it ranges from anywhere from one in 20 cells will have a beetle, to sometimes over 50% of them will have a beetle. Um, now, I don't want you to think, screw the beetle. How can we get rid of the beetle? The beetle is as important um, in our ecosystem as the bees are. They are um, a remarkable uh, insect to be able to, to co-opt these bees. And in fact, seeing bee beetles, these beetles in the landscape is indicative of a very healthy bee population. You can't have predator without the prey. In this case, the prey being the bees. And so just like lots of bees occur where there's lots of flowers, lots of beetles of these species occur where there's lots of cellophane bees. This will be a theme that comes up again. Right, so now it is uh, at this time, uh, you know, five weeks later, I returned to the, uh, the park and the bees were silent. You, I saw people picnicking on these tables and they had no idea what was beneath their feet. These bees will emerge one year later when the maple trees are in bloom again. And only I and a handful of people that joined me on a, a visit to this uh, park know uh, this little secret of theirs that they're underground. Other wild bees, about 30% of our, our solitary bees in, in Eastern North America, uh, nest above ground. And there's three flavors of these uh, nesting strategies. They rent pre-existing cavities, they excavate stems into hollow cavities, or they get a little fancy and they glue pebbles together with resin. The architects are not a common group of bees, so we're going to focus on the first two groups, the renters and the excavators. The renters, um, uh, some of our most common species are mason bees, osmia, and which are active in spring, and leafcutter bees, megachile, which are active now. And true to their name, uh, they build uh, nests with different materials. Mason bees build nests out of mud. Leafcutter bees build nests out of leaves. And they build these nests in a variety of cavities, sometimes old beetle burrows in trees, sometimes in people's backyards, in these bee hotels that have become very, um, uh, very, uh, a, a very fun pastime in recent years. They've been um, very popular. Uh, I will talk more about bee hotels later, but if you have questions about how to build or manage your own bee hotel, um, there's definitely uh, some strategy that uh, is involved with making sure your bee hotel is a safe haven for a bee and not an ecological trap. So above ground nesters need these building materials as well. We saw bees, all bees need a place to food, well, from flowers, but they also need uh, building materials. The leaf cutter bees need leaves to build their nest. The resin bees need sap from trees and mason bees need mud. So what we're looking at here, if we go from left to right, um, at least on the bottom here, is a series of brood cells. So the cellophane bee built her brood cells vertically underground. These bees build brood cells horizontally in a linear tunnel. So on the left, we have one brood cell and then she puts up a mud wall to partition this baby from the next. Then she creates another, she lays eggs, she puts a ball of pollen, then she creates another vertical partition and so on and so forth. And bees are remarkable in the sense that they're able to control the sex of their offspring. She puts females at the back and males at the front. The males are eager in spring and they emerge first. So it would be very bad for the males to be behind a female because uh, they'd have to crawl through um, the next generation. How do bees do this? How do they control the sex of their offspring? Well, it turns out that sex in bees is determined slightly differently than it is in humans. You know, in humans, we have X chromosomes and Y chromosomes. And if you have an XX, you're a female at birth. And if you have XY, you're a male. In bees, 
It also do with whether the egg is fertilized or not. Female eggs are fertilized with sperm from their mate and males are just an egg that receives no sperm. So females have twice as much genetic material. They have some from mom and some from dad. And in males, it's just mom. And so by choosing whether or not to fertilize an egg, the female can effectively choose whether she's laying males or females. This is um, a curious uh, leaf that I found walking uh, to a party uh, at my neighbor's house last summer. Um, and I saw, I noticed the edges had these little discs cut out of them. And I, this caught my eye because um, this is the telltale sign that a leaf cutter bee has been in the area. So this is a clue, even though I didn't see a bee, it was far too late at night. This is a clue that this leaf of a red bud plant um, is uh, supporting our native bees in the area. So I encourage you to explore your garden and look for similar clues like this. Um, I was in New Hampshire doing research and my friend and I, we found a muddy bank that was being covered in bees. And it turns out this muddy bank was where mason bees were collecting mud for their nests. So scrutinize observations that you make. Why does this leaf have perfect little moons cut out of it? Why are bees visiting a muddy bank when bees are vegetarians and visit flowers? Um, so just something to, to keep in the back of your mind. The theme here is how bees also you know, play a role in the landscape. And just as the beetles parasitized the cellophane bees, cavity nesting bees are also vulnerable to cavity uh, parasites. This is a leucospid wasp that um, parasitizes the nest from the outside. It takes a very different strategy from the conniving beetles. Um, I'm gonna show you a video and I hope this comes through. On the right side of the video, we have a female wasp and you can see her uh, ovipositor, her egg laying uh, device extending out of her abdomen, bypassing the cell that the female is currently constructing and then entering the second cell. And I want you to watch this magic trick as she does this. So there's a wasp on the right side and look at what happens into the, the second cell from the right. What? Like from the tip of her abdomen, of the ovipositor, she just laid an egg inside of this B cell. Um, I'll play it again just so you guys can to watch. And she like, pulls it out of, out of the ovipositor. And this, this bee, which is making this nest, has no way of knowing that has just occurred because she's already completed that cell. So this wasp has one up to the bee and effectively laid an egg that will um, dispatch the, the host bee uh, larva and consume the pollen and nectar to, to develop into a new wasp. And remember, this wasp is, you know, incredible in its um, biology and as important member of the ecosystem as these bees are. Um, the last um, uh, above ground nesting bee we're going to talk about are carpenter bees. So we have two types. We have big carpenter bees, which you might be familiar with, uh, hovering around your deck. And we have tiny metallic blue carpenter bees known as serotina. All carpenter bees are united because they excavate nests out of wood. The carpenter bees, the small ones, the metallic blue serotina, well, they excavate nests out of pithy stems, such as those found on elderberry or raspberry stems. So if you have raspberry plants growing in your garden and you cut the stems at about 12 to 16 inches off the ground, you're creating habitat for next year's small carpenter bees. These carpenter bees do not nest in your deck. Only one species of carpenter bee, in fact, likes nesting in human-made objects, and that's the uh, eastern carpenter bee. They build these long nests that often persist in the same uh, year after year, because it's hard chewing wood to, to make a nest. And so um, my first strategy is if it's not anywhere that's, that's going to compromise the structural integrity of your deck, then to see if you know, living with the carpenter bees um, or and giving them some space too is okay. But if it is posing a nuisance, well then I in, in urge you to refrain from using pesticides to, to control them and instead either painting over the deck uh, or plugging the entrance hole with steel wool or caulk. Um, inside the bees will not make it, but this will prevent them from using the, the deck 
area again, and also keeps pesticides out of the environment. Happy to talk more about carpenter bees too. I know everybody's got some experience with carpenter bees. I will say that the carpenter bees that often dive bomb your head are always males. Males are very territorial. And true to all bees, uh, males cannot sting. So although they seem menacing and may seem terrifying, I know as a, as a kid, I would run away from them. Uh, they actually pose zero harm um, and will slowly sort of, they'll, they'll disappear if you just, you know, sort of don't pay that much attention. Okay, so we talked about bees that build nests. There's bees that live underground and there's bees that live in cavities above ground. But what are they filling these nests with? Well, they're visiting them with, filling them with, with food from flowers because bees are vegetarians. Flowers are like grocery stores to bees. Nectar is sweet and it provides carbohydrates and pollen is protein rich. Bees are not often picky when it comes to nectar. They uh, visit, of, oftentimes will visit a wide variety of flowers to get their fill. And nectar as far compared to pollen is sort of, a lot of nectar is created equal. It's sweet and it provides the energy they need to fly. This is an interesting behavior of this carpenter bee um, where they're actually robbing the flower of nectar. So the carpenter bee cuts a hole in the base of this salvia with its mandibles and it sips nectar it actually bypasses what the flower wants it to do. In order to pollinate this flower, the carpenter bee would actually have to squeeze its head into the very tiny opening made for a hummingbird, not a bee. This carpenter bee doesn't have time for the flower's antics, and so it just cuts a hole in the base and drinks the sweet nectar. So in this case, this carpenter bee is a flower visitor, but not a pollinator. And so just because an insect is visiting a flower doesn't necessarily mean it's a pollinator. Carpenter bees, this doesn't, in studies that have looked at um, sort of pollen, ro uh, nectar robbing like this, sometimes it's really bad for the plant, other times it's not that bad for the plant. This is not a reason to uh, antagonize carpenter bees. Lots of other bees will also take advantage of this, and it's just sort of a thing that plants have to cope with. And although we're talking from the bees' perspective, we could also have another entire lecture all about plants' perspective. And I love posing the question of who's in charge here. Now a carpenter bee can chew a hole in the base of a flower and bypass the plant system, but the plant can also lace its nectar with caffeine to make the carpenter bee come back to over and over again. It can, um, it can uh, some flowers will even completely conceal their nectar inside to restrict pollinators to only the most effective ones. And so I love posing the question who's in charge, the autonomous bees or the plants that can't move. And, um, we, we can chat about that at another time. <laughs> um, okay, sorry, I'm getting, I guess, sidetracked. Okay, so uh, their flowers have pollen and nectar um, and uh, they bring, they carry nectar inside in their crops, which um, they're able to regurgitate when they get back to the nest. Um, and they stock the pantry with protein rich pollen. And this pollen, most bees carry on their bodies outside. Um, this longhorn bee, she has this incredible bottle brush of hairs on her hind legs. This is known as the scopa. Uh, the scopal hairs um, are the specialized hairs that are really intensely branched. Now, remember from the beginning, we talked about how branched hairs increase the surface area. Well, it turns out that the more branches your, hair, your hairs have, even if the branches have branches, that effectively allows you to carry as much, much more pollen than just a single strand of hair. And so you'll find that on bees' bodies, some of the hair is just a single strand where maybe it's, it's not used for carrying pollen. And all the pollen-carrying hairs um, are very specialized and very branched. Now, some bees carry pollen on their hind legs. Other bees carry it on their butts. So the leafcutter bees on the far left, all bees in the family Megachylidae, which are Osmia and Megachylidae, those cavity-nesting bees, they carry pollen underneath their abdomens. Um, and you can often see them on flowers. They'll hold their abdomen up almost at a 90 degree angle to their thorax and their head because they've worked really hard to collect that pollen. They don't want to give it back to the plant. They are trying to bring that pollen back to their nest. And since it's all dry in their hairs, if it gets dislodged, well, that's hours of work that might be lost. And so these, carp these leaf cutter bees and the osmia bees will hold their, um, their abdomens up uh, on their, on their flowers and it's sort of a neat behavior you can see. Other bees like this green bee here, she carries pollen on her legs um, and her favorite flower is the, the purple cone flowers which should be coming into bloom in your garden uh, pretty soon. 
And then there's a group of bees called the corbiculate bees, which are bumblebees and honeybees. And they actually carry their pollen wet in little pellets on their legs. So this pollen on their legs is not at all available for pollination. It is sealed in a packet that they carry back to their nest. Um, and you can actually see bumblebees with different colored pollens on their legs. And this is a really great way of knowing what flower a bee's been visiting. For example, I just spent, spent a month up in New Hampshire and lupin all along the roadsides has brilliant deep orange pollen. And so if I were to see a bee on lupin without orange pollen, I would say, oh, it's been visiting another flower and perhaps is visiting that lupin for nectar. If I did see a bee with orange pollen, um, it would tell me that that bee had most recently been collecting pollen from lupin. And this is another clue you can use to understand what bees are up to. It's all about the secret lives of bees. We have to figure out ways of figuring out their secrets. We can look for clues of where they've been collecting leaves to build their nests. We can look at the pollen on their legs to learn clues about which flowers they've been visiting, even if um, they're just flying through the air. Now, although, although nectar is pretty general, um, bees are often very picky about the pollen they eat. 30% of our bees are incredibly picky. There are bees that only collect sunflower pollen. There are bees like the ones I study that only collect blueberry pollen. And then there are bees that emerge in fall and only collect goldenrod pollen. And some of these specialist bees, or actually all these specialist bees, have very particular flight windows. The blueberry bees are gone for the year. They were out in May when the blueberry hills of New Hampshire were in bloom and I was doing my field research in Concord. Then right now, um, we have the sunflower bees that are getting ready to come out. Um, and they'll be on all the garden sunflowers that you grow. And still, months from now, the goldenrods and aster bees will be coming out. They're biding their time, waiting for their perfect plants to flower. Now, the thing about these specialist bees is that they've evolved over tens of thousands of years to be very good at locating their host plant. And I always say, if you plant it, they will come. If you plant sunflowers in a couple of years, almost certainly you'll have sunflower bees. And if you plant squash in your garden, you will almost certainly have squash bees. Squash bees are here in New Hampshire and in Massachusetts because we humans plant squash every year. This specialist bee is not native historically to Eastern North America. In fact, it's native to where squash is native, which is Northwestern Mexico and Southwestern United States. And over thousands of years, as native peoples traded and planted squash as part of the three sisters, beans, corn, and squash, these squash bees were able to move along those roots and colonize an entire continent, or at least uh, you know, Eastern North America, where they formerly didn't occur. The only reason these squash bees continue to live in Eastern North America is because we unwavering um, plant squash every year. If we were to stop planting squash for one year, the bees would not have any food because their sole source of protein is squash pollen. And if you think about these squash bees and their value to us, think about ratatouille. Think about Long Island cheese pumpkins, which by far are the best heirloom pumpkin for pumpkin pie. And think about jack-o'-lanterns. All of these uh, cultural uh, uh, items depend on squash bees for pollination. A squash bee has never seen a pumpkin because it's active when the squash plant is flowering, but we reap the fruits of their labor in fall and on. And one of the reasons why squash bees are such good pollinators of squash is because their entire life revolves around squash. If you're a gardener, you will know that squash flowers open sometimes before dawn. At 6 a.m., the males and the females are zooming around, the females collecting pollen, trying to uh, ward off um, very horny males. And then by noon, when the heat of the day um, causes the squash flowers to close, the, the females retire to their nests underground. But a nest is a female-only space. As I said, males are good for just mating in the bee world. And so the males have to find another place to take their respite. As it turns out, they love sleeping in the flowers. So if you go out to your backyard, you know, one, 2 p.m. this summer, 
I encourage you to peel open the starburst squash flower and see if you have squash bees in your yard. Now, don't worry, there's no, nothing to be alarmed here because squ male squash bees, like all male bees, can't sting. You're gonna look for a bee with very long antennae, an incredibly cute face, and an orange thorax, and you'll know you'll have squash bees. They'll be out in the month of July, which is a great time to look for them. And like every story I've told you today, there is danger lurking for the squash bees. There are cuckoo bees. Now, this is a bee whose entire life cycle, whose into all of its secrets revolve around the squash bee. Females don't build their own nests. Instead, they lay eggs in the nests of other bees. And about 15% of bee diversity around the world are cuckoo bees. So this is an incredibly successful strategy and incredibly widespread among bees. This cuckoo bee is a squash bee cuckoo. It's only way of reproducing is in a garden with squash bees. The female waits for its perfect opportunity. The mama squash bee is out on the squash flowers collecting pollen, having fun, and the cuckoo bee slips into the nest. She lays an egg inside of an open brood cell, slips out undetected, and mama squash bee returns. Unbeknownst to her, her nest has been parasitized. Cuckoo bees have a remarkable way of cloaking themselves in pheromones, and they also lay really, really tiny eggs that are imperceptible to the host bee. So mama squash bee comes back, she thinks everything is good, she lays her egg, she seals up the brood cell, but inside a killer waits. The cuckoo bee larva hatches very quickly with huge pincer-like jaws. The, the cuckoo bee larva makes quick work of the defenseless squash bee larva and continues to consume the pollen and nectar. This is an adaptation that only the first larval stage of cuckoo bees have. The first larval stage has these mandibles to kill the host bee, and then it turns into a white grub that continues eating the pollen and nectar. Um, but like every story we've told, cuckoo bees also have to watch their backs. This cuckoo bee got nabbed by a crab spider, camouflaged on a flower. And so what do we have here? Well, if we take a step back, we have a garden that we've planted squash in, and we have squash bees that depend on that squash. And that garden can also attract cuckoo bees, which depend on the squash bees, which depend on the squash. And this crab spider, which depends on this cuckoo bee, which depends on the squash bee, which depends on the squash. And I could keep going on. The list of intricate ecological interactions that a backyard garden can support is myriad. And I think is one of the most exciting reasons to uh, think about bees and pay attention to bees is that the more you part to pay attention, the more you're going to notice. So with that, I hope I've made the land of bees a little less mysterious. And I know everyone is sort of curious about what sorts of ways can we, um, what sort of direct actions can we, we do to help our native bee populations. And so for the final bit of the talk, I'm gonna give you some sort of takeaways and action items that you can do to support our native bees. I say you can use seeds to save native bees. That's S-E-E-D-S. -E -E -S. S stands for spread native flowers. Doesn't matter how much, it can be a pot on your balcony, it can be a backyard garden, it can be a, a garden like uh, that we manage at the campus. But the point is that we're picking native flowers. These are flowers that are native to the region that have co-evolved with our native bees and have a functional role in the ecosystem. These native plants often provide vital sustenance for migrating birds in the fall or sparrows in the fields. And our native bees are the ones that help those native plants reproduce and provide that link in the ecosystem. Gardens that are native can look, take a variety of forms. This is a woodland garden with columbine, um, another shade tolerant native plants, or it can be a wet meadow with uh, iron weeds and sneeze weed and goldenrods in the fall. It doesn't have to be a huge area either. As I said, it could be a sunflower on your balcony that would likely attract sunflower bees. So I have some recommendations. Uh, these are my picks, Nick's picks for season long blooms. The thing about planting natives is you want to look for diversity because diversity is going to beget diversity. The more different kinds of flowers, not only in color, but size, shape, and most importantly, bloom time, 
is going to give you the most numbers of bees in your garden. I always say plant, if you're going to plant three flowers, plant three that bloom in different months of the year instead of ones that all bloom on the 4th of July. So I recommend planting lance leaf coreopsis and foxglove beard tongue for blooms in May and June. Wild bergamot, which is about to pop in our gardens for the summer solstice blooms in early July. Culver's root and Joe pieweed will take you through July. Ironweed in August, New England aster, and then golden rods will take you all the way up until frost. And if you do that, not only are you providing food for bumblebees, which need food in every month of the year, but by planting glance leaf coreopsis, you're feeding aster specialists that are active in May and June. By planting New York ironweed, you're giving food to Melisodes denticulatus, the ironweed bee, as well as American lady butterflies, which depend on ironweed leaves to reproduce. And by planting asters and goldenrods, you're supporting tens of specialist bees that time their life cycles for the goldenrods and asters. And by planting them in your yard, you're making lives a little bit easier for these bees. This is what a garden at, our, at, our, at, at Tufts looks like. In December and March, it's a contemplative time. We think about and we wait eagerly for the, the thaw. In April, our shoots of these perennial plants start to emerge. Some of the early flowering trees like maples are, is what's supporting the early spring bees. In May, the cherries and the plums and the apples get going and this supports even more bees while our herbaceous plants, the ones that I missed listed on the last slide, are still producing new leaves. In June, the foxgloves and the coreopsis start going. In July, we have new flowers coming in like the culver's root. And you'll notice that we're trying to plant in clumps. Bees are really like it when you plant flowers in uh, groups of three or more. It helps them visually locate your garden from afar and helps them not expend extra energy going from their favorite flower to their favorite flower. Um, in August, this is when we're, our flowers are really coming into their own. We have the tall rudbeckias and cup plants flowering. We have ironweed in the foreground. We have a nice monarda bee balm in the front. I could talk about plants all day, um, but uh, you'll notice a diversity of colors, size, shape. In September, it's goldenrods and aster seasons all day long. Um, and our garden will bloom all the way up through October to often till the first frost. And if you're thinking of starting a garden, either really early spring or I think fall is a great time to start your garden. And some sources of good um, native plants and information um, can be found in New Hampshire. Foundwell Farm is great. Um, pretty, I think it's pretty close to Concord. I've been there before. Um, but also in Massachusetts, some of the places I know are great are Native Plant Trust and Blue Stem Natives. Um, and then if you're looking for seeds to start sort of a more wild meadow, I highly recommend Prairie Moon Nursery. They have this pollinator palooza mix or insectopia seed mix, and it's, it gives you blooms in the first year, and every year thereafter, your garden continues to be dynamic. I think that's one of the most fun things about growing gardens for bees is that your garden changes from year to year. The Coreopsis and Rebeccias, uh, some of the, the roadside Rebeccias, the Black-Eyed Susans, are early, um, early successional species. They like, they, they bloom in the first few years and they fade out, whereas other plants bloom after five or six years of growth in the garden. Um, and so I think that growing native plants uh, can actually be a really nice process that is continually interesting and exciting and surprising year after year. Um, uh, one of the websites, Grow Native, this is out of Missouri, they have a really nice set of formal designs. If you're looking for a more formal ornamental native garden um, that also has ecological value, they have some sample uh, designs of what, how you can format your garden. So they recommend certain plants in the back. And you can see one big takeaway is that all the flowers come in clumps, you know, at least three or more. And so that echoes what I was saying about, and, and this design is, is based on bee biology. It's not just clumps look pretty. Bees are uh, happiest when there are flowers planted in clumps. Okay, so that's spreading native flowers. Um, the second is E in the seeds, is employing a life cycle approach. And so not only do you wanna consider the flowers for bees, but you wanna consider nesting sites for bees. You wanna consider hibernation spots. So this might mean leaving some bare ground on the sides of, uh, of your yard or not mowing as much to make sure that bees that nest in your lawn 
um, will have um, a safe place to live. And in the fall, it might mean not, uh, or in the spring, it might mean not cleaning up your garden as quickly and leaving some of those leaves uh, for insects. I also think that um, bunch grasses, um, I will say, play a big role in, uh, in the bee life cycle. So these are sort of grasses like blue stem or a switchgrass, which add texture and intrigue to your garden. Bees, as adults, will use these grasses to host slumber parties, and male bees, which don't have a home to go to, will often sleep in clusters on the blades of these grasses, and they were and and uh, over multiple nights, they're very faithful to particular blades of grasses. And then these bunch grasses through the winter um, and in the in the spring provide overwintering sites and nesting sites for bumblebees. Some species require nesting sites on the surface beneath thatch, and bunch grasses like this provide homes for those species. So also consider by planting um, grasses in your yard, do so knowing that you're considering the complete life cycle. Where do adults need to rest? Where do species need to overwinter? I said earlier, resisting the urge to clean up your garden is a, another great way. A lot of, a lot of bees um, and other insects um, really don't start getting going until the temperature warms up. And if you can resist the urge to clean up your garden until at least May 1st, that'll be helping a lot of insects um, uh, that means that your garden will help a lot of insects pass through the winter unharmed. It's really tempting in late March during a warm spell. Now, I want to clean up my garden and cut up back all the stems, but um, resisting that and leaving it until the, the leaves have, the trees are starting to leaf out is a good sign. Some of the bees like the Xeratina that nest in stems or that nest in pre-existing cavities um, will also use hollow plant stems in your garden. And so by resisting the urge to clean up your garden um, or leaving stems intentionally for bees, you can support these native bees as nesting sites in your garden. Now there's a lot of interest in how to leave stems for bees. And so I'm gonna walk through the steps. If you want your garden to provide a home for these bees, the first year you have a plant like milkweed or wild bergamot or joe pieweed with hollow stems, and you let that plant grow in December, you cut the stems back to 12 to 16 inches, and you leave those stems standing through the winter. The next year, those stems are still standing, and bees that emerge in that year two will find those stems and build their nests in it. You still have to leave those stems standing one more winter, because next year, in those stems, bees will emerge to continue uh, their life cycle. And so the first year, the plant grows its stems, the second year bees nest in those stems, and then the third year bees emerge from those cut stems. Now it's a long process, but if you want your garden to have this ecological benefit of supporting bee nesting sites, this is how you do it. And this is not, it's not like you're bad or, or, or you know, it's, it's not terrible if you choose to cut your stems down. Um, I think gardens can serve lots of different functions. I think gardens can be great sources for foraging. Gardens can also be sources sites for nesting, but choose to make your garden good for both you and the bees. It doesn't have to come at a compromise. We can make gardens enjoyable for people and pollinators. There can be a give and take. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think that's, that's really a key takeaway. Okay, so that's S-E and the second E stands for eliminate pesticides. This is really simple. You know, what kills uh, a mosquito, what kills a tick, no matter what the pesticide company tells you, also kills a bee. And for treatments that don't directly kill a bee, often leave bees less able to be bees. These sublethal effects of pesticides are insidious. And in fact, they'll make bees less efficient at handling flowers. They'll make bees less able to fly far distances, or they'll less make her less able to remember the location of her nest. And so just because you see bees on flowers in yards treated with pesticides doesn't mean those pesticides aren't having a negative impact. And if the soils are treated with pesticides, think about a bee that has to live in a home underground that's laced with pesticides. Um, you know, a honeybee has a hive to go back to in a box above ground. Um, a native bee, a solitary bee that lives underground has to live in soils um, laced with pesticides. So just, um, I would restrict your use of pesticides. Okay, then this is my favorite part. We get to the D. The D is discover what's around you. 
I think this is one of the, the most important takeaways of today is um, go out and watch bees in your backyard or in the local park or at the beautiful pollinator garden in Concord that Diane put together. Um, and just take five minutes, 10 minutes to just notice bees. What happens when two bees land on a flower? Do they share? Do they kick each other off? How are bees moving across the flowers? Are they moving in circles? Are they moving in lines? Do they approach flowers, but then not even land? And why might they do that? Bees, in fact, are able to sense whether flowers have been pollinated already and whether there's resources from a short distance away. And so they might not even have to land to know whether it's a worthwhile visit. And these are things that you can see in your own yard. Um, uh, you can see the slumber parties of bees on sunflowers. Go out to your garden in a, a, a warm uh, July evening and look in the, where the, the ray petals meet the center disc of that sunflower. And almost certainly you'll find the slumber, slumbering bees. Um, you know, I think Mary Oliver put it really well, the, the poet, when she said, attention is the beginning of devotion. And in order to uh, conserve bees and make a difference in their lives, um, we need to have a relationship with them because people protect what they care about, but they only care about what they know. And so you're going to learn about bees and know about bees through your own discovery and exploration. Um, and everyone that I talk to, uh, even those that are, are sort of hesitant at first, um, like me, often get hooked on, on bee watching. So some bees that you can go out in your yard and spot, you know, cellophane bees are done for the year, but if you live near a sandy area, like in Concord, you can spot cellophane bees uh, I did some of my work at the Carner Blue easement um, right in downtown Concord, and these bees are all over the place in Mar March and April. Right now, if you have purple coneflower in your yard, look for these green, race car green bees. They're called bicolored striped sweat bees, and coneflowers are their favorite. And then um, as the goldenrods and asters and um, sunflowers begin to bloom, look for common eastern bumblebees. They're around all year long from May through September but they really increase in abundance late in the season. And this is a species that you can spot um, basically on any flower, there'll be bumblebees. And then the last thing, which is to, to complete seeds, is share it with others. To save our native bees is going to take a hive. Um, and so take what you learned today, even if it's just that bees are vegans and tell it to other people and uh, help them realize that there are a huge diversity of bees in Eastern North America, and some tips that you can follow like seeds for saving our native bees. So uh, I've gone a little over time, but I'm gonna leave you with a takeaway. And that takeaway um, is, you know, saving native bees um, might be uh, really, it seem, might seem overwhelming because there's a lot we don't know, or, you know, we're still learning a lot. But if you ever want, if you ever forget seeds and you wanna remember, the tips that I've, I've left you with. I encourage you to sort of just take a stroll and find some flowers and introduce yourself to the native bee neighbors who are there in your backyard, who have always been there, and um, who, who, who are there and who have always been there hiding in plain sight, right? As a kid, I was in my backyard. I didn't know there's this incredible, wondrous world um, waiting for me to, 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 to uncover. And you know, the more you pull, at this single thread, whether it's a bumblebee or a green bee, the more you pull at that thread, the more you're gonna find everything is interconnected. You're gonna start seeing cuckoo bees. You're gonna start seeing bee predators. You're gonna start seeing the beautiful seeds and the fruits of those labors that the bees have made. And when we slow down and we pay attention and we listen carefully to the stories and the threads that those bees have to tell us, we can be reminded of the things we can all do to help. It's not big things, it's small, intentional, repeatable actions, like planting their favorite flowers throughout the year, rubecchia, sunflowers, blueberries, tomatillos, squash, or telling the pesticide company, you know what, we're not interested. I want bees in my backyard because I like them. I'm curious, I want to show other people about them. Or teaching a child that bees should be revered and not feared. Which means at the end of the day, each of us has the agency to keep uh, our forests full of Andrina erigeniae and our old fields full of Bombus fervidus, our pine barrens full of Calides validus, our meadows in late summer full of Andrina nubecula, our cities full of Agapostum virescens, our headlands full of Habropoda laboriosa, our wetlands full of Duphoria novianglia 
are dunes full of Kalidi speculiferous, and so, so many others, all of whom enrich our lives and nourish our bodies and help us grow a more sustainable future. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Nick, that was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And the chat is blowing up with accolades. This was so fun. Your energy is contagious. I'm so glad you liked it. Oh my gosh, I loved it. I, I absolutely loved it. And I think I'm speaking for many, many people when I say that. Um, I don't know if you were able to multitask while you were doing such an incredible job, but it's wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Amazing, amazing, incredible. Um, excellent. Very specific and knowledgeable presenter and super relatable. This was so fun. <laughs> I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to echo. I'm going to echo. Willa, it was just fantastic. I'm left with so many things I want to ask you. And I just so much appreciate um, how you shared out the difference that every single person can make. It's, it's just really wonderful. Um, so uh, it's hard not to ask questions ourselves, but I'm going to go to the questions of our audience to start. Uh -huh. If you have some time, I know we ran over just a little bit, but we'd love I'm... to have you for a little bit longer. Absolutely. Um, so Kai asked, the soil on my property is marine clay. Can I help create nesting habitat by bringing in sand? Oh, really good question. You know, it's really, it's really tricky to know exactly what our bees need. So for every bee that likes sand, there are also bees that nest, you know, in clay and, um, uh, and in, in our in forests and things like that. One of the big things that deters bees from nesting often is really thick vegetation. There's not many bees that can nest in sod. So if your, your soil is a little sparsely vegetated, you know, 50% or there's some gaps, bees will often be able to make use of that. Um, the, the sandy loving bees, um, you know, you could certainly experiment. You could bring in, you know, a pile of sand and, and see who, who takes up residence, but don't feel like you need to change your yard to support different bees. Bees will be able to make use of those habitats because those, those habitats and the soils have been in the region for, for a very long time. Awesome answer. Thanks. So Ginger says, can you recommend an app or a book for a beginner at this to learn how to identify the bees? Yeah, uh, great question, Ginger. So um, there's, I'll recommend two. There's um, a book called Bees in Your Backyard um, by um, Olivia Messenger Carroll and Joe Wilson. They are uh, biologists in Utah, New Mexico. Um, and they have a, th their book is really informative and it, it goes into all the diversity of bees that occur across North America. It, it'll tell you little stories about the desert bees and bees that live in Florida. And it's a really great way of learning more about the diversity that we have. Then there's a book called Bees by Heather Holm. And um, she also has a book called Wasps. And she is really leading the, the charge on making pollinator identification um, and native gardening accessible to uh, you know, the general public. And her book, Bees, definitely highlights some of the common species and common genera that I talked about today too, um, and is a great starting place. And she actually just came out with a $10 pocket guide that has images of, um, I think it's just called maybe Bees Pocket Guide. I'm not sure, but if you look on Amazon, it's like she just came out with it. And it's a little foldable thing. I keep it in my car and it's a great tool to, to help yeah. explain and give an image to what I'm looking at. Perfect. Um, awesome. That's great. Um, so Maria asks, I have lots of sand hills in my brick patio. I thought they were ant hills. Are they really bees? How can I tell? Um, great question, Maria. So um, you'll want to look at the entrance, the diameter of the hole. B ant hills or B sand hills are going to have at least the width of a pencil as their entrance. Um, and an ant hill is going to be about the width of a pin. So um, I suspect that the, ant, the sand hills in your patio are going to belong to ants. Um, and, and the bee ant hills often occur earlier in spring um, and in sort of sandier or sparsely vegetated areas in your, your yard. Great. Um, 
Nick, Barbara wants to know, are solitary bees in woodlands? Great question. Yes, um, there are solitary bees that are active in early spring in woodlands when trees and spring ephemerals on the forest floor are blooming. I mentioned in the final slides, a species called Andrina erigenie, and it feeds on spring beauty, which is sort of a dainty little woodland mm -hmm. wildflower. Um, bumblebees depend immensely on spring blooming you know, bluebells and trout lilies and Solomon seals, mm -hmm. and they also visit the, the blooming canopy. Um, and so absolutely, the time to see them in the woodlands this year has unfortunately sort of passed. But you can also spot bees on goldenrods, you know, starting in September. Uh, if you drive along the Kankamagas Highway, it's like just blooming with goldenrods. And I have a, such a hard time not getting out and just looking at all the bees. Um, the ones you'll spot almost immediately are going to be bumblebees. But then you'll notice smaller black ones, some that hold their wings out, tiny green bees called sweat bees, um, they'll nest in rotting logs. So they nest in the forest and then they come out of the forest to forage on the flowers. So, right, um, maintaining both habitats, moist rotting logs near streams, which is this one species favorite place to nest, but also foraging habitat in the open sunny drier sites along the roads. Both of those need to be present for that bee to be happy. Great. So Maria um, is asking about yellow jackets. Yellow jackets always make a huge nest in the ground in my lawn every summer. My lawn mowing fellow usually finds them. I am very allergic to wasps, so I'm wondering what to do with these nests. One year, a skunk dug up and ate the nest. I usually try <laughs> to stay away. Um, do they serve any ecological benefit? Yeah. I'm going to answer the second question first, whether wasps serve any ecological benefit. And the answer is absolutely. I don't think any of us want to know how many little insects or crop pests mm -hmm. would be around without yeah. the, the predatory benefits of wasps. Um, so yellow jackets are sort of generalist predators and they'll hunt uh, a variety of insects. And unfortunately in late summer, that's when we start to interact with them is because they start to switch from hunting to grow the nest, the workers are sort of released from their duties and then they start going to whatever sugary solutions we have. So, you know, it's really, it's really inconvenient that yellow jackets nest in our yards. Um, I think that any sort of non-chemical intervention or a highly targeted chemical intervention is the solution. The solution is not to like spray the wasps on flowers with pesticides or like on, on like around the table. The solution would be to find the nest. Um, and there's a variety of solutions. You can like pour boiling water down. Um, you could attempt to cover the entrance with a stone, but also be wary that sometimes they dig out a second entrance. Um, one technique you might try is some people have thought of putting peanut butter in front because raccoons love peanut butter and raccoons also love wasp nests, the yellow jacket nests. And uh, I've, I, don't, I don't have a yard here in Medford. Uh, so I have never been able to try this, but if you're looking for non-chemical solutions, you might try that. Um, hmm. Great. So a couple of other questions. Louisa is wondering, can native bees live in non-native plants? It's a great question, Louisa. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. So the, the short answer is yes, that there's lots of non-native plants that um, bees can make use of, especially in cities. Like for every, you know, garden that has all these native plants, there are, you know, 10 to 100 times more flowers that are potentially non-native along roadsides and train tracks that bees are totally making, advantage, making use of. I will say that the ecological role of those non-native plants is greatly reduced. Butterflies, um, uh, can't develop on non-native plants usually. Um, and so planting non-native flowers, especially in like urban gardens, um, can actually be like a really great way of attracting bees and getting people to get up close with them. But doing so knowing that they're not playing as much of a role as they otherwise would be. And so I think it's like not bad to have non-native plants in your yard. Don't, don't feel ashamed. Like Russian sage, it's incredible. Like bees all, go all over it. But know that Russian stage is only providing nectar for those bees. It's not a good pollen source. And so plant Russian stage and love it, 
but also think about maybe we could have some other pollen plants like sunflowers to complement Russian sage. Um, again, I think a, a big thing that I try to get at is this is not something to like be worried about making a mistake or your garden is not as good as it could be. Like make decisions that you really like. And I, I give you the information so that if you want to support bees, you'd have the knowledge to make those informed decisions. Great, thanks, Nick. So the, so a follow-up question on that um, is, I've noticed that bees like knotweed flowers. Is this nutritious even though they're not native? I leave some plants standing for them. Oh my goodness. Well, it turns out Japanese knotweed, which is incredibly noxious weed, um, was introduced originally because of its incredible honey that, that, that bees, honey bees make from it. Honeybees love Japanese knotweed. I would encourage you to look at the Japanese knotweed when it blooms in the fall and see whether other bees besides honeybees are using it. I think a really great, it's really easy to say, oh, this plant is a great bee plant mm -hmm. and for the plant to be covered in honeybees. I think it's another thing to say, this is a great bee plant and to see metallic blue bees and bumblebees and shiny green bees and maybe a honeybee and know that even if it's not a total bonanza, you're supporting many different kinds of bees. So I think, Japanese knotweed is great for honeybees. And if there's a beekeeper in the area, he, he or she probably really thanks you because the honey coming back is, is really tasty. Um, but honeybees are fine. And I think the ecological sort of terror that Japanese knotweed wrecks on the environment is sort of worth taking it away. Like I usually get rid of it. And I will say, if you want something else to be as aggressive and fill in that space, I think it doesn't do very much to like take away knotweed and just let the stems grow back. If you can, dig up the knotweed and replace it with either cup plant or Jerusalem artichoke. Both of these are sunflowers that are native to the area, highly aggressive, but native. And so they will outcompete that knotweed and be a really nice replacement that does serve an ecological role. Um, Jerusalem artichoke um, also is edible. It's like, it's also what's known as sunchoke. Um, and so it's give and take. I, Jerusalem artichoke is, I think is a really great replacement for, for Japanese knotweed. And it's like sort of the thing where in the fall you dig up the knotweed and you put the tubers in the ground and you'll see them duke it out. And I, yeah. And, and, and there are specialist bees. There's Andrina um, helianthi that specializes on late blooming sunflowers like Jerusalem artichoke. So you're not just providing more food for honeybees that's native, you're actually providing food that native bees depend on. Wow, that's a great, great suggestion. Thanks yeah. for that, Nick. Yeah. Never um, heard that before. But just yeah, be I'm careful, it is very aggressive. Like don't do it in like a very neat area, but do it in a place where you want it to take over. Where the Japanese knotweed tends to grow anyways in places right. we don't actually want it. Well, no, I mean, it, it basically effectively replaces, like Jerusalem artichoke naturally grows on sort of riverbanks, like that's mm -hmm. where it normally grows. And so um, it's like a perfect complement. Yeah, I agree. That's exciting. Huh. So that's great. Oops, sorry. Um, so Nick, if I could just ask one question, because some of the research coming out about leaving stems is pretty new. And I noticed that your first thing was cut the stems in winter. So I'm just looking for a timeline in terms of that first year. When you say cut the stems in winter, are you meaning like come there in December and cut the stems or after the garden is kind of um, finished for the year? I think if you're if you're interested in leaving stems, you can cut them in like the, the first of March um, and okay. let all the goldfinches and all the birds enjoy the seeds for winter. And then right before the bees emerge in spring, you can cut the stems. Okay. If you want a bit neater presentation of your garden and um, you can cut them in December and it takes the seeds away, but it might look, make the garden look a little bit neater for winter if you're concerned about that. Okay, thanks for that. That's very helpful. Um, Diane, I was... actually had a question about the stems too, coincidentally. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you guys mind if I steal the show for just a second? No, absolutely. So, so Nick, you had said um, cut them in the winter and then leave them for the second year because that's when the larva is inside of the stem. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Can you 
cut the stem knowing that the larva is in there, like cut it really low to the ground and just place it to the side of the garden? Or does moving them in any way interfere with that, that complete metamorphosis? Mm, so the short answer is moving them shouldn't interfere. If you do the moving at the, you know, in the winter of that second year, like November, um, and you just place them in a bucket on the side, mm -hmm. they will emerge next year. The tricky part is, and maybe this is what you love doing, is, is paying attention enough to, to know which, which stems right. have bees in them. Right. Now you can use clues because mm -hmm. bees plug their nests. Mm -hmm. So leaf cutter bees will plug their stems with leaves or mm -hmm. chewed up leaf pulp. Mm -hmm. uh, mason bees will plug their nests with, um, uh, with mud. Yeah. And so it might be really fun to go out into your garden and sort of say like, hey, I'm going to watch this patch of like yeah. 20 stems yeah. and go back every day and see if females are coming and going. Mm -hmm. um, also, don't be disappointed or concerned if bees don't use the stems. Like the bee has to find them. Um, and just taking the steps to make sure those stems are provided every year, eventually a bee will come to your garden and use them. Oh. And one thing is that bees are often very faithful to where they're born, like where they emerge, because they live there, their mother found a nest, so it might be a good place to hang out. And so once you have bees nesting in your yard, typically they come back year after year. Oh, so awesome. in the garden behind me, we have a longhorn bee that lives underground. And every year, she's, I always see her nest. And she nice. just, and it's always in a very different place. And it's, it's her offspring every year, right? Different offspring. But they always nest in the, just the, the bare soil in our garden bed. Nothing yeah. special, just, you know, sandy dirt that was there that we then planted. And she mm -hmm. nests in the gaps between the plants. Right on. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I was curious. Um, I do have a blog post on the TPI website. If you just type in, it's called the right way to leave stems for native bees. Perfect. And it's <laughs> basically what I outlined, but it's a, a written document that you can, you can use. Uh, uh, so something we could direct um, fellow gardeners to. So Absolutely. we don't just keep saying the same thing over and over. Awesome. Right way. Your stems. Thank you so much. And then there's some recommendations for plants that have hollow stems. And as I learn about new plants, I'm always updating the blog post with like, hey, this stem actually works. And yeah, that's fantastic. Oh, I'm so excited to check out your blog. Great. Thank you. All right. Diane, it looks like we have one more question if you want to take that one. Um, hopefully I'm seeing. Can we make these slides available? Is that the question? That's the one. Yeah. Um, so I uh, we can go to Nick for that also, but this was recorded this and so it will be shared out on the New Hampshire Audubon YouTube channel. So um, folks can go and look for it there. And Nick, if there's anything further in terms of that, um, let us know. And a couple other questions are coming in now. So no. um, absolutely, we can make these slides available. Um, I guess the other question is about bark mulch. Yes. So, yeah. Really great point that yes, bark mulch does tend to deter bee nesting. Um, I think bark mulch is a great way to get plugs or native plants established. After that, they don't really need to be mulched because they don't really need to be watered. They're mm -hmm. really drought tolerant. So mm -hmm. I think mulching in the first year is a great way to suppress pretty noxious weeds. Um, that being said, I'm continually astounded by bees. And last year we found Agapostum inverescens, the race car green bee, just nesting in mulch. So, <laughs> you know, bees don't like to follow the rules. And in fact, when we make a rule, they definitely don't follow the rule that we've created. <laughs> so, um, you know, potentially mulch half your garden and see if you can find bees nesting there. And you'll notice that bees have this distinctive orientation flight. So when they're approaching their nest, if it's been disturbed at all, or they're trying to look at it, they'll hover like this sort of very quick zigzag above the ground before they dive in. That's mm -hmm. a really great way to look for where bees are nesting. First is like, why is there a bee flying towards the ground? There are no flowers there. And mm -hmm. the second thing is like, wait, why is this bee hovering above this one patch of ground very intentionally? And then if you blink, you're like, wait a minute, where'd that bee go? Yeah. It goes in the ground. Cool. Good That's tips. great. So one, uh, one other, will TPI have another sale in the fall? So uh, Maria is alluding to the fact that we just had a native plant sale. We collected seeds from these gardens and then we grew them uh, and then sold them for a discount to the, the, the neighborhood. Um, it was like wildly popular. It's like the second time we did it, it was great. Um, 
So we won't have another plant fail in the fall, um, but we will uh, have an opportunity for the community to come and har help us harvest seeds. And then you get to take these seeds home. Um, and so we'll leave some seeds for the birds, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of the seeds um, we'll, we'll show you how to clean them. And then we'll give you tips on how to germinate them and start your own garden. Wow, that's great. Oh, gosh, amazing. That's a, that's a great idea. That is a yeah, we call it we call it seeds and cider. You get to drink mulled cider. Seeds and, and you get to cider. Ah, oh, oh, that is great. Mm hmm. I'll be looking at. Will that be available on your blog as well? The dates. Yeah. If you sign up for TPI News, you'll get updates. Yeah. Got it. Check. <laughs> cool. I think uh, I think it's probably wise to end with that particular question because I've got a. Uh, I've got a clue that people are just going to keep rolling in and we're going to be here till 10 o'clock at night. Um, but this has been so educational, informative, and fun. I think that is one of the biggest, biggest elements of this particular webinar was this was so fun to watch and listen to. And that is not always the case with webinars, especially those pertaining to science. So Nick, like, I, I'm sure all of us could be applauding you if we were able to from our, our personal computers. Just Thank you so much for bringing your enthusiasm and your obvious passion to this particular presentation. Standing ovation, says a lot of people, right? Well, thank you for that. I just had a, a, a blast talking to you all tonight. And, and please feel free to reach out with questions um, or comments or, you know, photos of bees. It just, it mm -hmm. makes my day seeing people spotting bees in their yard. So oh please don't hesitate to reach out. Wonderful. Well, with that, before you go, what would be the best way to reach out to you? What is your preferred method of contact? Um, you can either reach out to us via email. That's okay. Tufts Pollinators. I'll put that in the chat. Tufts Pollinators at gmail.com. Awesome. Easy, um, easy. Or you can find us on Instagram or Twitter at Pollinate Tufts. Perfect. Awesome. I think you just uh, gleaned quite a few new followers from this evening's presentation. I know I personally will be adding you to my list. <laughs> awesome. Diane, anything else yeah. you'd like to say before we wrap up for the well, evening? I'm just going to echo Willow. This was really <laughs> wonderful. So, so much appreciate you being here. Um, such great information. But as Willow said, it was it was shared in in such a fun and informative way, and easy to take away lots of messages from what you shared with us. So thank you. Um, I'll just share with the audience that we're actually doing a bio blitz in our pollinator habitat at the McLean Center on Saturday. Um, and I wish Nick was going to be there. That would be really fun. But anyway, we are going to have some uh, great professionals who will be leading field trips. So if you have any interest in that, you can go to the New Hampshire Audubon website um, and sign up for the pollinator bio blitz. Hopefully we'll find lots of different insects, including bees. Um, we do have an entomologist who is leading one of the trips. Um, and Heidi Holman from New Hampshire Fish and Game will, will lead a trip looking for butterflies. And uh, Emma oh, Erler okay. um, will be our horticulturist, or our plant biologist. So it should be a great day. Um, and Nick, I think you've worked in some habitats that I have in Concord. It, they looked very familiar but I was doing birds there. So oh, I've wonderful. done a lot of work in the, in the Carner Blue National Guard properties there. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I've spent, I spent five years working at the Concord Airport and the, the Carner Blue easement right off the of channel. So yeah, it <laughs> looks very familiar and it's a really <laughs> fun habitat. So um, I'm glad you're in there. Maybe we'll run into each other someday. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So. Thank you, and thank you to all of our audience for um, sharing this pollinator webinar with us. This is our last webinar for the spring. We actually moved into summer this week, um, and we will come back in October, and Doug Ptolemy is actually going to join us in October for um, our last pollinator webinar of the year, so we're pretty excited about that. So thanks again, Nick. This was a great way to celebrate um, pollinator week. Really appreciate you being here. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Uh, Super. Have a wonderful evening. Yes, you too. Yeah, you Happy too. summer, everyone. Okay. Bye. Take care, everybody. Good night. Bye, Diane. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Willa. Bye.